Welcome to Berkeley Writers at Work. It's really a pleasure to see so many of you here, even though I can't actually see you. I'm Maggie Sokolik, Director of College Writing Programs, and I am pleased to welcome you on this lovely, rainy California day. Our, our guest, Scott Saul, is an historian and critic who writes for both academic and popular audiences. He has written for the New York Times, Harper's Magazine, The Nation, and Book Forum, among others. He is the author of Becoming Richard Pryor and Freedom Is, Freedom Ain't, Jazz and the Making of the Sixties. He's also the creator of Richard Pryor's Peoria, an extensive digital companion to his biography of this legendary comedian. You can find this on becomingrichardpryor.com, a quote, portal into the Peoria, Illinois world of Richard Pryor's first 20 years, a passageway into the material he reshaped in his comedy, end quote. As he says on his website, Professor Saul's interests run to the, quote, great cultural watershed that was modernism in the arts, whether it took the form of William Carlos Williams's poetry, Charlie Chaplin's films, or Duke Ellington's music, and to the starburst of creative activity that has followed up to the present, end quote. He teaches courses in American literature and history here at UC Berkeley, where he is professor of English. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also tell you a bit about our interviewer. John Levine has a BA in English and Black Studies from Oberlin College and an MFA in Creative Writing from San Francisco State University. He has been teaching writing since 1995 and teaching public speaking since 2006. Before becoming a teacher, he worked in radio and television. An award-winning playwright, John has had plays produced throughout the USA, as well as in Canada, Mexico, India, Australia, the Philippines, the United Arab Emirates, and the UK. And of course, he also coordinates this, the amazing and long-running Berkeley Writers at Work series. Please put your hands together in a silent welcome for Scott Saul and John Levine. Scott, whenever you're ready. Oh, um, do you want me to just start by? Uh... Yeah, please, please. Okay. So, um... John and I were talking about uh, that I would begin with with reading something uh, from my Richard Pryor biography. And I thought that par partly because of all the cultural uh, controversy that's been stirred up by um, Dave Chappelle's uh, recent Netflix special, and also because it, the the kind of the story behind the story of, of putting together uh, this part of my Richard Pryor biography, it, was, it would be a good place. Uh, to go to. So this is an excerpt from a later chapter in my biography. It looks like an episode uh, in 19, uh, 1976, I believe it is, uh, 77, sorry, um, when Richard Pryor was set to give, uh, to play at a benefit for gay rights at the Hollywood Bowl. Um, it was excerpted in the Guardian, um, the newspaper. So I'm going to read this excerpt. Uh, it's titled Richard Pryor Meltdown at the Hollywood Bowl. Uh, the tagline is, uh, sorry, I'm in the middle of this little guest. <laughs> the uh, um, tag was uh, that they put on it was starring at a gay rights fundraiser. The great stand up saw other black artists being treated with racist contempt and launched into an astonishing tirade that the 17,000 strong audience would never forget. And then this is. My piece. On September 18th, 1977, when Richard Pryor took the stage of the Hollywood Bowl as a headliner of the Star Spangled Night for Rights, a benefit. Oh, I'll start this over. Long, it's a long first sentence. I apologize. On 18th September, 1977, when Richard Pryor took the stage of the Hollywood Bowl as a headliner of the Star Spangled Night for Rights, a benefit promoted by an early gay rights group, the event had, according to one journalist, all the makings of a cabaret version of Woodstock. Less than 15 minutes later, when Pryor ended, 
by asking the audience to quote, kiss my happy rich black ass, the concert was closer to a cabaret version of Altamont. The good vibes had dispersed. A night of unity had turned into a hot steaming mess. Many in the crowd booed or shouted abuse. Richard Pryor, you just committed professional suicide or quote, kiss my, your ass hell. I'd like to put a hot poker up it. Others cheered a provocateur who before he had dismissed the crowd as quote, as self-serving quote, faggots has spoken bravely about the joy of gay sex and exposed the fault lines of the gay rights movement. Okay, now I have to actually step out of this reading and just say something about the language of this piece, which I meant to say, but I forgot, which is that this language, there's a lot of obscenities here um, to be true to the historical what happened, um, you know, I, I feel that I should get, use some of them. Uh, you know, the, the term faggots was used quite a lot. And I think it's important, it suggests where it's an epithet, it's a negative. Um, and the fact that Pryor was using it, I think um, is, is worth noting. I'm not gonna use the N-word, uh, which Pryor did, um, use uh, in, in this event. Okay, so okay. <laughs> I'll keep going on here. Uh, so forewarn forewarned is forearmed here. Okay, so others cheered a provocateur who before he had dismissed the crowd as self-serving quote faggots had spoken bravely about the joy of gay sex and exposed the fault lines of the gay rights movement. Still others sat poleaxed trying to grasp how in coming to the Hollywood Bowl, they had taken a detour into the twilight zone Quote, in more than 14 years of covering the great, near great, and terrible of show business, I have never seen anything like it, wrote John Wasserman in the San Francisco Chronicle. To call what happened bizarre would not, for me, do it justice. It was like watching a person come unglued in front of you and then, as in a cartoon, disappear piece by piece. The meltdown at the Hollywood Bowl was, an, in its own way, a vintage prior performance, artful and impulsive merciless and hapless, and above all, devilishly attuned to the hidden dynamics of the moment. The driving force behind the benefit concert had been the Save Our Human Rights Foundation, a San Francisco group composed largely of gay professionals formed in response to the anti-gay crusade spearheaded by Anita Bryant and other Christian conservatives in Florida. The foundation hoped to do for gay rights what the American Cancer Society had done for cancer, quote, to educate people, but in a nice glossy way. Dignity was of utmost concern. When the show's producer discovered that one of his performers, a comedy act, would satirize Brian directly, the act was removed from the bill. The appeal for quote, human rights meant always aiming for the moral high ground. So the 17,000 people assembled at the bowl, mostly gay men, sang the national anthem, quote, with the volume and fervor usually associated with conventions of the veterans of foreign wars. Performers avoided specific mention of gay life, much less gay sex. In the words of another observer, it was, quote, an evening of unspoken assumptions. Richard's friend, Lily Tomlin, came the closest to striking a direct chord when she reminisced about the 50s as a time when, quote, sex was dirty. And of course, no one was gay, only shy. Over the course of the evening, Pryor grew increasingly allergic to the atmosphere of moral superiority. He despised euphemisms, yet here he was, headlining a gay rights benefit that couldn't put the word gay in its title. He felt the victim of a bait and switch. Like at least one other black artist on the program, he'd originally been asked to perform for a human rights rally, pure and simple. Other resentments gathered. He scanned the sea of faces in the audience and spotted only a handful of black people. And he noticed that the Lockers, a young black dance group on the bill, kept suffering from poor treatment. When the dancers asked, asked stagehands for help with the lights, the stagehands paid no notice. When the dancers performed on stage, one jumped over six chairs in a single bound. The audience sat in their seats. An hour later, just before Pryor was set to perform, the formerly indifferent stagehands leapt to fix the lights for two white ballet dancers. And the formerly blase audience applauded these dancers as if they were, quote, some bad motherfuckers. Backstage, Pryor saw the fire marshal dress down a locker for setting off a small explosive on stage as a special effect. And he saw the show's promoters refuse to come to the dancer's defense. To Pryor, 
All this was racism in action. He simmered and awaited his turn. When he finally walked in front of the audience, Pryor didn't speak for a little while. He prowled back and forth like a pent up animal. Then he pounced. I came here for human rights, he said. And I found out what it was really about was about not getting caught with a dick in your mouth. The crowd erupted in laughter. You don't want the police to kick your ass if you're sucking the dick, and that's fair, Pryor continued. You've got the right to suck anything you want. With these three sentences, Pryor had outflanked all the other performers on the bill, some of whom, like Tomlin, had open ties to the gay community by stripping away the airy talk of human rights. He had brought into the open the basic demand of the gay struggle, sexual freedom in the face of police harassment. Quote, I sucked one dick, he said from the stage, drawing his audience back into a scene from his red light district childhood. Back in 1952, sucked Wilbur Hart's dick. It was beautiful, but I couldn't deal with it. Had to leave it alone. The crowd roared. It was beautiful because Wilbur has the best booty in the world. Now I'm saying booty to be nice. I'm talking about asshole. Wilbur had some good asshole. And Wilbur would give it up so good and put his thighs against your waist, that would make you come quick. With that confession, Pryor became perhaps the first major Hollywood celebrity, celebrity to talk graphically about his own positive experience of gay sex, and certainly the first to do so in front of tens of thousands of people. Pryor then spoke of the romance that kindled in him. I was the only motherfucker that took Wilbur roses. Everybody else was bullshitting. I took Wilbur the roses and said, here, dear. Again, the crowd hooted in delighted disbelief. Now that he had worked the audience into the palm of his hand, Pryor became indecisive, addled by some combination of drugs, alcohol, and the complexity of his feelings. Speaking softly into the microphone as if musing to himself, he asked, how can faggots be racist? He recounted what he observed with the lockers, then his tone shifted and he aimed pure scorn at the audience. I hope the police catch you motherfuckers and shoot your ass accidentally because you motherfuckers ain't helping N words at all. Howls rose up from the crowd. Any remaining sympathy he threw away with a rant that pitted women's rights against welfare rights. The crowd booed in response and Pryor goaded them back. Yeah, get mad because you're gonna be madder than that when police chief Ed Davis catches you motherfuckers coming out of here in the lot. It was hard to tell where Pryor's allegiances lie. Was he on the side of the police or on the side of sexual freedom or simply on the side of Richard Pryor? I wanted to test you to your motherfucking soul, he continued, as if the anger he'd unleashed was a thought experiment on his part, a trial he designed to winkle out the truth in their hearts. The gay people in the audience he determined were the same gay people who a decade earlier had looked the other way at the black community's desperation. When the N-words were burning down Watts, you motherfuckers were doing what you wanted on Hollywood Boulevard, didn't give a shit about it. And with that, he hoisted his backside into the air, asked the crowd to kiss it, then walked off to a chorus of boos, a smattering of applause, and thousands of stolen faces. The show's choreographer came on stage and cried in anguish, I hope you realize that was unplanned and everybody involved is very, very embarrassed about it. He was promptly booed too. Pryor had left a mess that no apology could clean up. It took two weeks for the firestorm sparked by Pryor's performance to blow through the LA and Bay Area press. The LA Times devoted over a full page to the original event, then ran 17, lang 17 letters in two installments in response to it. The bad feeling lingered. Among the commentators, most numerous were the moralists who judged Pryor an obscene homophobe who should never have been permitted on stage at the bowl. Quote, his street language was abusive, filthy, and racist, wrote one audience member in the LA Times. It takes a certain talent genius, if you will, to insult 17,000 people, black, white, male, female, straight, gay, rich, and poor at one time. Others thought Pryor wrong in his sweeping comments about gay racism. Quote, most of us in the gay rights movement which does not include all gay, right, gay, gay men and women, were previously involved in other civil rights movements, such as those for black and women's liberation. An activist explained, now we are fighting for our own rights and we need support. 
especially from those we have supported in the past. Yet Pryor did have his defenders among the gay community's outliers, those further from them, its power centers, who praised him for forcing the community to examine its own blind spots. An LA Times reader wrote, quote, being a black homosexual and living here practically all my life, I can say that the California homosexual is the most extreme of bigots. He hates blacks, fats, women, and himself most of all. Pryor's actions were crude, but sadly true. If one refuses to believe, let alone, let, if one refuses to believe, let any person who is fat, black, ugly, or female try going to a gay club alone. In fact, as LA's gay activists noted to their displeasure on other occasions, the city's biggest gay disco admitted few non-whites or women, and its gay baths tended to have a pull up your shirt rule that excluded any man who wasn't well-toned. Lily Tomlin, for her part, felt that gay men tended to look down upon lesbians, and she appreciated how Pryor had asked everyone to consider their prejudices. Quote, when you hire Richard Pryor, you get Richard Pryor, she told the show's producer before the event. Lost in the swirl of postmortems was the taboo that Pryor had broken and the anecdote he had revealed. Part of the silence is, under, is understandable. A family newspaper, for instance, was not about to quote a line like, quote, Wilbur had some good asshole. But other distortions were more complicated. The outrageousness of Pryor's remarks seems to have inspired either mishearing or disbelief. Several journalists reported that Richard had said that he had experimented with a gay man and, quote, didn't like it. One called Wilbur Harp, uh, the man he said he had had sex with, quote, a presumably fictitious Midwestern homosexual, as if a male sex partner for Richard Pryor had to be a figment of the comic's crazed imagination. Yet Pryor was not confecting his story out of thin air. According to his friend Cecil Grubbs, Harp was a gay teenager in Pryor's home city of Peoria, Illinois in the mid 50s, at a time when there was little in the way of a gay community there. He and Pryor whiled away the hours at the Blue Shadow Bar in Peoria, a tavern famous for serving a hangover cure chili so spicy that its mere aroma sent customers into a sweat. In the mid 60s, according to Harp's brother Hillis, Richard and Wilbur crashed for weeks at the same apartment in Chicago, the would-be comedian bunking with the would-be cosmetologist. Even after Pryor moved to his estate in Northridge, LA in 1976, the two were still close enough for Pryor to invite Wilbur Harp out, out for a week-long vacation. Whether or not they truly had sex is probably unknowable. Harp is dead, so he cannot speak for himself. And it's perhaps less important than the fact that Pryor wished on that night for it to be true. He was seeking to convey something about himself and the world in which he was raised, a world distant from the affluent gay audience at the Hollywood Bowl. Quote, in my neighborhood, whatever you were was cool, he said in a related 1975 interview. You could be a thief, murderer, or closet queen. There was a faggot that turned more tricks than the prostitutes, but nobody ridiculed him. Dudes avoided him during the day, but could be seen creeping around his house late at night. It didn't matter. We were all part of a community. Sometimes, as at the Hollywood Bowl, Pryor slammed into the fact that he wasn't in Peoria anymore and that he had lost that community, that no matter how large his estate in the San Fernando Valley, he would continue to feel out of, a pl out of place, that no matter how high he rose in Hollywood's pecking order, his sensibility would never match up with that of its right-thinking liberal precincts. The debacle at the bowl left him reeling, besieged. As the controversy raged on, Pryor did not calm the waters by issuing an apology. Instead, he continued to act out the polarities of his Hollywood Bowl performance in his own life. In the week following the gay rights benefit, he made two impulsive and startling commitments. The first commitment was to his on-off lover, Deborah McGuire whom he proposed to and married within the space of a few days. The second was to an experimental piece of gay theater, a monologue by a little known actress named Krez Mursky that nowadays would be labeled performance art and queer performance art at that, which he included in his primetime TV show in total defiance 
of NBC. As part of his segue into that monologue, Pryor camped it up as Little Richard with the high pompadour, glittering cape, and leering lusciousness that were the trademarks of Little Richard's gender-bending style. In that costume, Pryor blew air kisses to his audience with a twinkle in his eye. Okay, that's the end of the, uh, that passage. Thank so you. Thank you for the various interruptions. Th thank I'm, you, I'm at my parents' place, so these things happen. This is the reality of, uh, of uh, webinars uh, these days. Um, thank you, thank you for sharing that and um, so much to, to dig into there. Um, I just wanna, at this moment, just let the audience know the format. Um, we always start with a reading from the, uh, the Berkeley writer um, and then I'll have a conversation um, with Scott for probably about uh, 40 minutes. At the very end, um, we'll open this up to questions from the audience. If you do have a question, um, you can type them into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and I will read your questions aloud and, and Scott will answer them. Um, so Scott, thank you. Thank you for um, reading that and thank you for um, being the 2021 Berkeley Writer at Work. We're really pleased to have you. Uh, well, th thank you everybody for being so here. You want to yes. I really am feeling yeah, very honored. Great. Oh, good, oh, good. Um, so you and I corresponded a little bit about this excerpt um, from uh, your book, Becoming Richard Pryor. This was excerpted in The Guardian. Um, so, uh, and I think this is a great excerpt because it really captures um, who Richard Pryor is, if we can determine who Richard Pryor is. I mean, he, he very complicated, um, full of contradictions. And as you said at the very end, he made two impulsive moves. Um, so I, I guess my first question is, would you say that um, impulse really defined um, his actions? Was that his MO, do you think, from point to point? That's a great question, uh, the psychologist. I mean, I think that he was in love with feeling in the moment. I, I think that, um, you know, when we get into psychology, you know, much more deeper, but, you know, he, he was an abused child. You know, he was somebody who lived in constant fear uh, growing up, uh, you know, growing up in his grandmother's brothel in Peoria, Illinois. And he just was always wary, always watchful. He didn't want to be at the wrong end of, of, of violence. And, um, so that meant him very bottled up in a lot of different settings. But then he found in the stage was a place where he could tap into spontaneity and creates experiments in, in spontaneity, stand up, improv comedy. So I do think that that was something he was in love with was uh, finding a way to create, turn impulsiveness into art. He was incredibly witty. Um, I think he struggled with where impulsiveness led him outside of the stage. You know, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, in terms of those two commitments he made, you know, one is to a marriage and uh, that marriage, you know, had the ups and downs and not, not too long lasting, you know, it ended with him, you know, shooting the car of, of that um, of Deborah McGuire, and after that act of violence, you know, no, he was an, he he had been abused, and he became abusive in many ways. Um, that did not last very long, you know. Then there's the TV show that he tried to pull together, which also didn't last very long. So there's probably a, a, a lesson here that impulsiveness is not good. It can be good for creating incredible works of art, but it's good to for if you're if you know that that's your nature of your character. It's good to be partnered with somebody else who's going to keep things humming along, the system humming along. The TV show did not last long, but I think it's amazing that he brought this kind of, uh, you know, what I call kind of a work, work of early queer performance art into, you know, NBC primetime. And people were like, what is this? I, I must have, you know, I'm in the twilight zone. People were really shocked when they saw this thing that just appeared in the middle of his TV show. Um, not really announced in any way. Um, so anyway, th that's the, a bit of uh, an answer to your, to your okay. question. Okay. Um, the seed of this book, um, for people who haven't read it, and by the way, I recommend this book, it's fascinating, um, was a little known chapter in Richard Pryor's life that he spent some time in Berkeley. 
uh, a, a little less than a year, right? It was eight, nine months. And I, I assume that that was the seed. You had heard about this somehow and you wanted to dig further. You couldn't really find um, any, uh, there wasn't a lot of documentation about the time that he spent in Berkeley and in the Bay Area. So could you talk a little bit about that that background? Sure. Sure. Well, you know, um, and you people in the audience are writing their own research papers, so maybe this will be a helpful story. You know, um, you know, the advice I, I got, you know, from my dissertation advisor, which I thought is the best advice ever, is like, you know, you know, you want, you're going to write a book, you know, so look on your bookshelf, scan those titles, and think about the book you wish was on the shelf, and then write that book. It's easy as that, you know. <laughs> Um, and that's great advice. And, and there was no good biography of Richard Pryor. There's no good critical study of Richard Pryor, you know, some great essays about him. And I, I thought he was really worth a book. And uh, just such an incredible, important figure. And when you look at the biographies, which are pretty thin for various reasons uh, before mine, and, um, you know, they all be like, oh, he went to Berkeley and a lot changed when he got to Berkeley. You know, then he came back from Berkeley and he was this different kind of performer, different kind of comedian, right? And so Berkeley was had a very big place in the story, the narrative as it was told as this really pivot point in, in his life and his art. But there, it was, there was no detail, like what actually happened in Berkeley? What was he doing? So my first thing was to try to just, you know, what were the threads that I could pull on research-wise? So, and they didn't even, the people didn't agree, like, when was he in Berkeley? There was a, a lot of debate. He was here for a few months, for a few years. I mean, really, people didn't know. And that's matter of fact, right? So first, I want to just, you know, get these, a bit of these factual rivets in place. So anyway, one thing I knew was that he had been, he had DJed a bit, uh, or been involved with KPFA, go KPFA. And uh, so I went to the Pacifica archives, KPFA is part of Pacifica, radio network, which is in North Hollywood. And they had these newsletters. So they pulled out the newsletters for me and I just sat there in the KPFA main offices looking through these newsletters. 1967, no mention of Richard Pryor. 1968, no mention of Richard Pryor. Uh, I think it was in 1970 that this guy, Alan Farley, starts talking about Richard Pryor. He really loves Richard Pryor. 1971, Alan Farley seems to be mentioning Richard Pryor a lot. He has this column called Media Monitor, like a media criticism column. And then I noticed in September 1971, Richard Pryor is hosting a show on KPFA called Mondo Banana. Um, like Mondo, it was, there was a big documentary, or kind of weird documentary uh, midnight movie called Mondo Cane. So it's like the whole world's a banana, you know, like a banana peel. Anyway. So he's hosting that show. I was like, okay, well, this is something I can nail in place. He did this show for a month in, in September, 1971. Well, who is this guy, Alan Farley? Well, it turned out Alan Farley was still working in public radio. He'd been operations manager of KPFA in 70, 71. And he was hosting a radio show still for KALW, another great station. So I contacted him and Alan Farley, bless his soul. He's since passed, but I met him. And I said, I want to interview you because you, know, you overlap with Richard. And, and he said, well, actually, you know, I didn't just overlap with Richard. I drove him up to the Bay Area and I, he was my roommate. And uh, we started talking about that. And he was like, and in fact, also, I have all these tapes uh, because he was an operations manager. He was a gearhead. And he thought, and he's probably one of only maybe a handful, maybe the only person who thought this guy, Richard Pryor, is, is an important historical figure. And I want to tape everything he does in, or ask him to tape things he does in the Bay Area. So he had like these you know, six to eight hours of, of tapes. And uh, he said he was willing to let me listen to them. So I was like, oh my God. So went to the station. He will only let me listen to them in the station. And then I just took very intense notes, transcribing everything on these tapes. And they completely blew my mind, you know, and because everything in the, nothing repeated itself in the tapes. Like everything was different. He would do like, oh, I'm trying to think of a, a screenplay that's like a black exploitation movie and he'd be riffing on the screenplay. He did sound collages, um, you know, uh, that were meant to kind of punch back 
against um, those who had suppressed the Attica prison riot. Um, there was stand-up, new kinds of stand-up. Um, there were just him trying to do stream of consciousness poetry uh, at 3 a.m. in the morning while he was high on cocaine. I mean, it's like, there was just so much crazy stuff. And it really gives you this, gave me the sense, like this was a guy who came to Berkeley and didn't know what kind of artist he was gonna be and was experimenting in that very Berkeley spirit uh, that was bringing together the kind of artistic experimentation of the counterculture and the kind of strong kind of radical edge of the black power movement and all this combustion was happening. And that of course led me to, you know, research does, you know, I pulled the thread of KPFA that led me to Alan Farley, interviewing Alan Farley led me to these tapes. These tapes brought up other people who were, you know, um, other leads that I could pull and people I could interview and archives I could consult. So in the end, I felt like I, I ended up with a very rich sense of, of Pryor's interlude in Berkeley and one thing led to another. And, you know, before you know it, you know, you're, you're really trying to write the, the first deeply researched biography of an important figure in American cultural history. Which clocks in at nearly 500 pages. I mean, it's- it, it, Yeah, I'm it's only going through the first- uh, No, I know, I too. know, and, and all rich material. Um, so this is a great, um, lesson for our fledgling researchers out there that um, it's not as though Richard Pryor was an obscure figure. I mean, he was a well-known celebrity, and yet you found this thread that led you um, to find all of this. I mean, from Peoria to the Bay Area to LA. Um, Archives so are amazing. Don't just use Google, you know, like, I mean, uh, or, or, you know, and nowadays so much is is uh, digitized. So archives are digitizing the material, but you got to go to them and You've got to search within the archives. You know, I, I can't, there's so many stories waiting to be found. Um, please, please do that work and, and don't limit yourself to Googling, you know, the night before. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. You heard it here. Not first, but you heard it here. So um, this book, um, this was your second major book, is certainly narrative driven. Um, would you say that it has a thesis embedded in that narrative? Um, that you were aware of as you pursued yeah. the research or that you found later? Um, yeah, I think there was a, a thesis, a very loose thesis. You know, it's a, a capacious thesis, you know, you could say. Um, I felt like the standard argument about Richard Pryor was that like, he was great because he found a way to unzip his brain and all this crazy stuff came out that was really radical. Uh, and that he was, you know, targeting police brutality before it you know, was on on the radar of other, other folks. And he was, you know, a tri tribune for sexual freedom, you know, uh, and it was just about him like letting loose in that experience, like the counterculture is like letting it loose. And, you know, my, and so that meant that there was no real history. It was just like, he learned to be disinhibited and that was his greatness, uh, which contributes to a lot of stereotypes about black folks, you know, uh, too. It's like, it plays into those stereotypes. Um, and I was like, no, this guy's a great artist. He's a great craftsman. And he's shaped by all these experiences he has in history. He has a point of view that comes from growing up in the red light district uh, in Peoria as Peoria is trying to stamp out its red light district and become an all American city and target his family as public enemy number one. Um, he has uh, experience from being on the front lines of desegregation because he's like one of the only black students kind of integrating these formerly all white schools um, in the 50s. He has experience like in terms of his comedy from like absorbing the very, you know, physical comedy style of people like Sid Caesar and Jerry Lewis. And then he arrives in, you know, in Greenwich Village. And what do you know, it's like the moment Greenwich Village is really hopping with this new thing that nobody's heard of before called improv comedy. And he's like the first generation to be involved in group improv in New York City. And this will play into the power of, of his comedy where he kind of really is, is really wonderful at it, bringing group pop improv into standup where he's playing all the different characters that three people might play in group, you know, improv. Anyway, so all along the way, I was tracing how he was shaped by history uh, to kind of widen his aperture and just to see what's going on. Uh, kind of got radicalized at certain moments, like the, 
the mid to late 60s, early 70s, like so many people did in America. But also he was learning things as an artist and he was wide open to everything. So he could learn things from Red Fox uh, and he could learn things from Jerry Lewis and he could learn things from Mel Brooks and Lily Tomlin. It's so many, Bill Cosby, you know, so many different uh, artists he was learning from. Charlie Chaplin, uh, you know, Melvin Van Peebles. I mean, it goes on and on, you know. So bringing all that together. So I wanted to give a kind of historical portrait of an artist. And I think that, you know, in the end, part of the, the thesis, as it were, if he was kind of, because culture history is like, uh, you know, he was at such an impact because he found a way to bring together these two radical cross currents of the American 60s, you know, the Black Power Movement, the Black Freedom Movement, and the, the counterculture and put, put create this kind of alchemical reaction um, by putting them together in that space of, of performance. And it doesn't just remain in stand-up comedy. It's one thing, another sub argument is like, it's also, he has a huge legacy as, a, as an actor uh, that we should attend to and the kind of opening up of Hollywood to performers who are not white. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And creative people who are not white. Right, right. It's true. It's true. Um, yeah, I mean, we could just talk, and, and the book does devote a, a good portion to his film work. I mean, you know, he, he was definitely a, a major um, performer. Um, in addition to the book, you have a website, um, Priors Peoria, uh, sort of that is, I don't know if it complements the book, if you'd say that, but can you talk a little bit about how that came about? Did that was that did that happen hand in hand with working on the book and do you see um managing and um and, and keeping up that website um is it is it the same as writing um is it the same impulse how do how does that um how does that line up with your practice as a writer yeah uh that's great uh, it's funny i should put the the becoming link into the chat so people can check it out while i'm talking um so that came about because, you know, to write the first 70 pages of the book or 80 pages, whatever it is, that are set in Peoria, Peoria, Illinois, kind of a typical city of 100,000 people, about the size of Berkeley at the time, you know, a uh, hundredth biggest of like American cities or something like that at the time. Uh, you know, uh, to set Richard Pryor in Peoria, I had to know the history of Peoria. And there was no like, good history of Peoria. So in some sense, I had to research the history of the urban history of Peoria from the 30s uh, to, to the 60s in order to be able to set Pryor's family and then Richard Pryor himself within that history. Uh, and it was a history that, you know, was about a, Peoria had been a huge sin city. It was kind of like how we kind of imagine you know, Las Vegas, like open gambling, open prostitution. Um, you know, and that's actually why his grandmother moved to Peoria uh, to be, you know, run a brothel in, in the 30s. Uh, you know, I, I had to understand its history of segregation and desegregation, um, you know, and, and so on. And so I had a lot of research about what Peoria was like. And then I also had a lot of great documents from about Richard Pryor, his childhood, his report card. Uh, pictures of him with his, his classmates, you know, and, and, you know, his best friends were like these white girls, you know, like it, it's it, when you see the pictures, it, it brings to life his child in ways you, you, you might not imagine before. I had a great the part of that story of, of his uh, became, becoming a comedian as a young person is about his involvement with his black community center and his mentorship um, by this incredible woman, Juliet Whitaker, who was kind of the resident black bohemian wearing dashikis in the late 50s, early 60s in Carver, uh, in Peoria. And, and that was a great history that I wanted to bring in. So it was a whole world around Pryor. And for the purposes of the book, Pryor had to always be kind of at the center and I had to have that narrative drive. But then I had all this very rich materials that I felt was, was very revealing. Um, you know, we have these kind of histories of like big cities like New York City or Chicago or LA or San Francisco, but much less work done on like mid, mid-sized mid Midwestern cities like Peoria. So I thought it was just an incredible resource. Um, 
And, uh, and then the question was how to build a website that would be curated and draw people into it. So, uh, you know, I didn't do this myself. The great thing about this work was that it's collaborative, it's more collaborative than the act of writing often is. And it involved, you know, people who designed the web pages. Um, you know, I wrote a lot of the text, but then I brought in a lot of research assistants who wrote a lot of the, the every, every primary source is annotated so that people have a way of understanding it. So build, you know, building a team I think it was, you know, several hundred sources. So everything has to be annotated and, and brought into relationship to one another. So research, I mean, now with the tools that we have, research is not just, okay, I wrote my book and then I'll just file away all my notes and, you know, maybe I can write another book or maybe this just, you know, goes away. Um, so it's so great. You, it's, it's you great could do that, that but, yeah. you know, I, what I found is that, you know, like, People there's still a lot of people go to this website, and um, I, since then I've created another website which comes out of my teaching here at Cal, uh, which is called the Berkeley Revolution, um, which you can go to at Berkeley oh, sorry Revolution Berkeley Edu, and I encourage people to go to that, and that actually was created collaboratively with these um, seminar students in American Studies, and um, has over six hundred documents. It's kind of uses the format and architecture of Richard Pryor's Peoria, but is about Berkeley in the sixties and seventies. And we have hundreds of people going to, you know, or as many as thousands of people going to this website in one day when like Kamala Harris mentions something about Berkeley and it was like Berkeley desegregation schools and suddenly it's like blowing up. Um, but you know, the, this, is, this website gets used and, and, and it's, it's actually influenced new scholarship and it's just a resource, it's, it's quite a resource, I think, you know? So, you know, to, to find things in archives, put them together into a story and then give that story to the outside world, but also give the evidence that is, is, is kind of making, allowing you to tell that story. It's very important. Well, maybe we'll get uh, dozens of more hits. Um, these are in the- in I, the, I, uh, I hope so. Hey, and one thing I would say is that, you know, one of the hardest things to do, and then I'm talking to some fresh, you know, freshmen out here, freshmen, first years, is to you give evidence and then you explain what it means. You know, a quote, you quote something and then you draw out what's important in the quotation. And that two step of like setting up a quote, giving the quote, and then ex, ex, drawing out the meaning of the quote is actually very, very nuanced. It takes a lot of talent to do it well and a lot of practice to do it well. And I found that that's one of the most um, powerful things that I can help to teach by just asking students to do it a lot with these annotations. It's like, okay, you found this document, why should people look at it? And to explain that in two sentences or two paragraphs, depending on how important the document is, it's actually a, a really crucial skill. And a lot of people assume that it's self-evident. It's never self-evident. And if it's self-evident, <laughs> why are you using the quote? What, you know, what's, what's the point of, of using it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, always be developing. Always be developing. Um, I certainly want to ask about your teaching, and I have I have pages and pages of questions here. I'm still on page one. Um, I'd like to um, move uh, to talk about your. Have you talk a little bit about your other um, major book, "Freedom Is Freedom Ain't Jazz in the Making of the '60s," which um, at first glance appears to be a very different book in that it's more traditionally. Um, an academic approach, um, for lack of a better word. Um, when I first cracked it open, I was, of course, interested in the topic, but I expected um, not a dry treatise, but something a little less interesting than, than the Richard Pryor book in terms of narrative. But I found it was very, um, it, it was narrative based as well. You would tell episodes about the Newport Jazz Festival, which I didn't know about. I mean, I knew about the festival. I didn't know about the, know, the riot, riot on the beach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, can you talk a little bit about how you approach that? Was, was there a difference? I know they were at different points in your life, but the how you jumped into Freedom Is, Freedom Ain't versus Richard Pryor. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, that, was, that came, the Freedom Is, Freedom Ain't came out of my dissertation, you know, uh, which I wrote for Yale American Studies program. I considered it a cultural history 
um, of that kind of jazz shaped world of the, of the 50s and 60s. And, and to be honest, I really didn't know what I was doing. I think that everybody writing their first book, they don't really know what they're doing. And they're just they're kind of assembling these pieces and then trying to figure out how they can make it go together. And I would just say that, you know, when I gave my prospectus for that book, you know, it had these 10 chapters, you know, listed, uh, you know, that I was going to write. And I ended up writing, I think about four and a half of those chapters, which ended up being like the 10 chapters of that book. So it's to say like, you have this idea, you're going to cover this much, you cover this much, but it ends up taking that much space. Um, and what I, I wanted to do is describe, you know, the kind of the innovations within jazz at that time and make those felt by the reader. You know, I, so that was one thing. And then I wanted to, people to understand how those innovations within jazz rippled out into other spheres, poetry, drama, political organizing, and so on. But at the, the core of it was that I felt like there was a way of writing about jazz that hadn't wasn't being done qu quite yet as much as I wanted it to be done uh, in terms of like, you know, talking about looking at the your bookshelf and like what book's not there. And I felt like, oh my God, these people like John Coltrane and Charles Mingus are such incredibly inventive, creative, powerful and consequential figures in American history. And we have maybe a musicological study of, of John Coltrane. Um, we have a lot of anecdotes about their lives here and here, but people haven't made like a kind of argument about what they were doing and, and made us feel it in their music. So I, I was very much thinking of like, you know, how do I bring together um, the, the kind of writers that I love the most who write about the experience of music, um, you know, who make us feel inside the experience of music. So somebody like Grail Marcus, was important to me, but in other ways, he was an insufficient model because he's not a musician himself, I don't believe, and he, does, he doesn't get very technical. And a lot of jazz is actually, you know, you have to know kind of what's going on. So I turned to other people like Scott DeVos, an incredible jazz historian, Gary Giddens writes very well about, I think, the music in terms of like, in a way that's technical, but makes, even if you don't read music, even if you're not a musician, you can feel what he's talking about. So I thought about that a lot. How do I dramatize the music in a way that gives a sense of the changing texture of it, the changing soundscape, but also looks at it at a kind of a structural level, like how, how does it move from part A to part B? How is the, what are the rules around improvisation and how do they play into the sound that, that comes to us? Sorry about that. Of course, the phone's ringing off the hook. Um, so all, all of us just say, so I, at, at the core of what I wanted to do was make the music come alive in a way that like, captured the aesthetic intensity of the experience of listening to music, but also then attached it to larger changes happening in the culture around, free, say, what, what freedom meant um, at that moment of the Black freedom movement. And suddenly all these th connections started to, to appear. You mentioned um, the importance of, of commenting um, when you cite a source and, and when, you know, when you pull a quotation out. And I, I suppose I could share my screen, but I'm just gonna hold this up because I have a, a screen grab. This is from Freedom Is, Freedom Ain't. And what you do, you have a four bar break from uh, Charlie Parker's solo on A Night in Tunisia. And then I just want people to notice below that, you comment on it and, and the words aren't important. I'm, gonna, I'm not quizzing you on what you wrote, yeah. but my question is, do you see that, um, do you see there's a similar approach to a close reading of a text, a close reading of words as there is to what you did with music? Um, were you trying to do the same thing there? You know, looking at this four bar break of music, um, how you approach that? Is it the same as, as you know, approaching a, a quotation? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, th that's, uh... They're related, but you know, writing about music takes different, you know, uh, approach than writing about literature or or whatever it might be. You know, you have to be thinking about the specifics of the medium. But certainly, like I, I think that I, I began my skills as a close reader writing about literature uh, in high school, 
And it was only in grad school. I was like, I, I, I got to do something similar with music. You know, um, I got to learn that. I got I a long way to go. And I had some musicologist friends who really helped me through that. Um, but in that case, you know, I, you know, a lot some things that's really important is like, what is the quote that you're choosing? You know, um, and in that case, there was this very famous Charlie Parker break from A Night in Tunisia. And then, you know, John Coltrane had kind of rewritten A Night in Tunisia as his song, Liberia, moving us from North Africa to West Africa. And he had his own four bar break. And I could, you know, that was such a beautiful thing that I could compare these two four bar breaks, this kind of solo saxophone. And you could really get a sense of their different styles just by pulling up these two four bar breaks. Um, and that I think, you know, gets at an important thing for the writers in the audience, like choose your quotes well, like what quotes are gonna resonate? You know, um, oftentimes it's the stuff that is most kind of confusing, you know, um, often something that's like got some, some juice to it that you can't quite understand at first, you know, don't, don't pick something that seems self like obvious uh, in what it's saying. You know, pick something that's got some kind of tension to it. Um, and, and that's often what I find works the best is like, well, here's something that's kind of difficult. And I'm going to then as the I'm kind of a critic, but I'm also trying to help explain how I was confused and wrestle with those confusions and difficulties and therefore be a kind of proxy for the, the reader or listener who's also kind of like, what is the, what are these sounds? How can I make sense of them? You know, so lead lead us lead the the reader along with me through complexity. I'm just trying to describe it, you know, uh, as a passage through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to switch gears here um, just to talk a little bit about or hear from you a little bit about your own writing practice. So. <clears throat> I was gonna ask you where you get ideas, but what I really wanna ask is once you have an idea, what's your next step? You have an idea, maybe this is something I wanna write about. Um, take us through what happens after that. Do you take notes? Do you go right to research? Do you outline? What's your, what's your writing process if you have a yeah. routine? Uh, well, I would have to say that, um, you know, usually I'm kind of fascinated by something, you know, you know like fascinated by a work of art you know, and I just, I know that I have a very intense response to it. And then I want to understand that response. You know, um, you know, lately I've been thinking that really love um, the, the composer and pianist, uh, Ryushi Sakamoto, Japanese pianist. It's so amazing. And I've just been playing the song, uh, uh, Flower is Not a Flower. And I've been thinking that, you know, if I, if I don't want to write something, he's actually um, has advanced throat cancer and is going to pass away. And I want to write something in tribute to him before he passes. I, I just I want more people to listen to him. And, and there's something about this song during the pandemic that was deeply consoling to me. And the kind of language of minimalism in which it's written, but the richness that finds within minimalism. So... I haven't written this piece, but just talking to you, I'm starting to think, get ideas. And, you know, I would, you know, I think about where, what in the song are like the most intense moments, beautiful, moments, strange moments, start taking notes, you know, and then, you know, that's kind of inductive out of my own experience of the artwork. And then I, you know, I'd be like, okay, I, I need to know what other people have said about Ryoji Sakamoto. And then I would, you know, go on a, a big search. And that might lead me to discover that some stuff is only in Japanese. And <laughs> I'm gonna have to pull in some friends, you know, to help me out uh, to translate important passages, There's something like that. But, you know, uh, and then I would bring all that stuff together, take lots of notes, and then uh, start writing, try to figure out where to begin. You know, I've become more and more interested in beginning narratively, you know, with story. So I probably begin with something about how during the pandemic, you know, the most consoling thing I could find for myself was to play Raishi Sakamoto's A Flower is Not a Flower, a sort of Zen riddle in the form of minimalist piano composition. Mm 
you know, something like that. And then talk about when I played it, how I, you know, the difficulties learning it, whatever it might be. Right. And then, you know, scope out. So that's the kind of thing. I, I did want to say something about process in terms of the piece that I read, if that's okay. Um, yes, please. I, I think that that, you know, I knew that this Hollywood Bowl thing was a big incident, you know, it was caused a firestorm of coverage, right, in the press. But I didn't even know what he said, right? So I had to find the tape of what he said, right? And it turned out that there was an archive at the New York Public Library of um, the International Gay Information Center. That was an early uh, gay rights organization. And they actually had the tape of his 12 minute performance, okay? So until I listened to that, like, you know, I didn't know what he actually said. And it turned out, as, as I talk about in my piece, a lot of people got it totally wrong. They thought he, you know, that he said he didn't like gay sex. Well, no, there's, there's no way to listen to the actual tape and think he's not saying that gay sex was great. You know, he said he had trouble handling it, but it was because it was so great, you know, you know, in terms of the sensual experience of it, right? So, um, you know, once I had that tape, then a lot of other things started opening up and I was like, okay, now I got to really reconstruct what, what happened and how it played out in the media. So I went to the, there's a great archive at, um, in LA, the one archive, it's, it's a big uh, archive for kind of queer history. And they had a big folder of stuff uh, that, about this benefit. And that allowed me to get things like the John Wasserman quote about this guy performer coming unglued. And they had stuff from some gay publications that were very, otherwise be very hard for me to find. Did a lot of database searching as well. And then I had to talk to people, you know? So I talked to Lily Tomlin, you know? And I talked to um, the people in the lockers, you know, that's the group in the hip hop group, this kind of proto hip hop dance who had been brought by, who had been dressed down by the fire marshal by for send, setting off these incendiary devices on stage. So I got their perspective as, as, as well on it. So a lot of assimilating all this stuff, gathering what's falling, this leads to this, this leads to this lead. And just being like, I don't like be powered by your curiosity. Curiosity is a superpower. And like, it will take you so far, you know, and just realizing that there's no one response to this Richard Pryor performance everybody had a different sense of what actually happened and that's the story is the th you know the different responses the booze the applause and then the people were like what the hell just happened and sort that out you know so um you know once you've done all that research and you have a sense of how you can categorize it then you have to think about okay how can i tell the story in a way that's not gonna overwhelm the reader, but kind of lead them through the process. So it's like, you know, how do you begin? It's like, I've never seen anything like this, you know? And I said, it was like, you know, the, um, you know, you know, gay version of, gay cabaret version of Ultima, you know? And then it's like, what happened? Okay, it was crazy, but what actually happened? And then you kind of step people through it. Um, stitching in all these things that you found in various archives or interviews along the way. And, and, and then of course it led me to this question of, you know, who was Wilbur Harp? So then like once I had, I, before that I didn't have the name of Wilbur Harp before I had listened to the tape. And I was like, who is Wilbur Harp? It, he didn't come up in my earlier research about Peoria, but I could go back to the people who I had interviewed about Peoria, uh, who had knew him back in Peoria. And I talked to his friend Cecil Grubbs. He's like, oh yeah, Wilbur Harp, yeah. I, yeah, Wilbur's, his brother's still alive, you know, and I talked to Wilbur Harp's brother, who had to be like, you know, 90 at the time. He's like, oh, yeah, I remember Wilbur went out to Northridge, you know, you know, and yeah, he's definitely gay, you know, it's like, it's not this, this person was not made up, you know, but that, that involved a certain amount of detective work um, to find these people. Um, you're not going to find that by Googling, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But, you know, now this piece exists and it gets Googled all the time. I, I just saw there's a, you know, a piece on, in, I think it's CNN.com about the Dave Chappelle controversy. And it refers to this. 
So this is like you create as a, as a scholar, as a writer, you create knowledge by doing this kind of work and then you make it available to people and then it has a longer life um, because you've kind of curated these things together and brought it into the fold of the story. And it seems so important now in, in this in this time where people are getting simplistic versions of a story, they, they get it, you know, wherever they get it on the internet and that's it. I know the story. I don't have to dig any further. This is the way it is. And, um, you know, it, it doesn't really encourage research. Um, you, you really need to dig to find the real story. And there is a real story out there. If you're curious about something, you need to pursue that. Um, when you were talking no, no, about just to, yeah, to that, I just say like one of the lessons of Richard Pryor's life is that people are just so much more complicated than mm -hmm. we give them credit for being. And, you know, in his life, every step of the way, he was always given these roles and he'd be like, this role sucks. It has no complexity to it. And that was a big thing that he brought to the screen or even to TV when he did TV is like, black people are not simple. And I'm playing these characters and I refuse to turn them into just simple cartoons. I refuse to be that. And, uh, you know, I think just remembering that you know, I think we have a, a, a tendency uh, to flatten people uh, and to, to try to dig deeper and, and to, you know, um, you know, let, let people, you know, sometimes hang in a, in a space of quiet and, and let give people extra space to riff and, and, and they might say things that doesn't add up about what they were thinking. And that becomes then part of your story. They said this, they also said that, like there's this ambivalence here. They're not just, there's not just one answer. Um, you ask a question of somebody and they go someplace totally uh, different. And you're like, so, some part of me when I started doing interviews was like, that's frustrating. I wanted to know about that. You know, this performance in The Tonight Show, why are you telling me about when he went to the perform in a prison? But you start realizing that actually there's something important about how people think that you can understand by how they respond not to your question, but to something else. So, you know, just just go with the flow and, and try to draw out what you can out of what you get. Now, as I ask you questions, I want to make sure I'm letting you riff that I'm not. Uh, no, no, there you go. Okay. Um, you uh, you mentioned as you were trying as you're telling the Richard Pryor story or a new piece that you want to work on that you want to guide the reader, and that leads me to ask you: Do you have an ideal reader in mind? Who is your audience? Do you have an audience? And does the does the the ideal reader change during different stages of your writing? Um. It's a great question. ideal reader. I mean, you know, I, this might sound like a cliche, but one writes for oneself and, and people that you know, that you trust, you know, a kind of inner circle of readers. Um, and I think that's something that I, I feel strongly though, is that like, you need to take responsibility, as a writer, you need to take the responsibility for how your work is read and could be misread. And I think that's a really important skill to try to develop as a writer is like, okay, I've written this thing. I think it means this, you know, but if somebody who's coming from a different place could misread it and think it means something totally different, then that's a problem. And you, so you need to be extra mindful. You need to practice this kind of extra mindfulness as a reader to think about both like you're in some ways you're just writing for yourself and you're trying to, you know, uh, it's hard not to just try to write about what interests you. But then when you, you know, put it into these things into words, you need to think about like, how clear are you? And, and where are they? There are certain words that could press certain buttons or could open up doors that you don't want to open up or which doors do you want to, you know, which ambiguities do you want to have resonating, reverberating, which ones don't you? So I think this is something important that I've learned as like a write for larger audiences is just how important it is to kind of think about every sentence and, and, and how could it be understood? What's the tone, you know, um, are, are, is, the, is the tone inviting or could it be thought to be alienating? You know, um, if you use the, you know, second person plural, the we, 
are you saying something that's, why are you drawing people into a set of observations that kind of everybody could have? Or are you, are you being a little tendentious? And is it kind of a royal we where you're presuming that other people are gonna hear things that you hear, but they might not, you know, uh, or something like that. So I, I think that's a very important process, you know, to go through. It's like, first you gotta generate the prose and maybe this is what I'm going to answer I'm coming to is like, you ge I generate the prose. I'm kind of writing for myself because it's just hard enough to just get the stuff out there. But then as you kind of write and revise and revision is so important in my nonfiction workshops, I emphasize that so much, you know, um, everybody needs to revise again and again, thinking and in consultation with readers, you know, um, you try to hear what other people who are unlike you might hear and think about how you can make it better. Um, I have one or two more questions, but I do wanna make sure I um, allow room for the audience to ask questions. So if you do have a question, you can post it in the Q&A and I will get to those. Um, one thing I wanna ask you, Scott, is you mentioned um, you know, having uh, you know, some trusted readers. Do you have people who read your first draft, second drafts? Do you have a, a set of people that you go to um, and you don't have to name names, but I'm just curious where they they fit into the process. Yeah, I mean, there are people who I've known uh, from grad school or colleagues, you know, here um, who, you know, so oftentimes it depends on like, what's the subject, you know, you know who do I think is gonna be interested in the subject? Um, but, you know, we've been reading each other's work um, and it's hopefully it's a mutual thing. You know, <laughs> there's some people who just help me, and I've never helped them because you know I, I couldn't. They're, they're too great. Um, but you know, uh, I think that's just a you know, like that's imp it's important. You know, to you know, obviously one works with editors at, at some point. You know, uh, and an editor can be a great sounding board eventually. But you have to develop that relationship to get to that that place. And before you're at the point of working with an editor, your, your, your nerves might be a little more raw and you might feel, so that, that's when you're gonna send it out to your friend who is, gonna, is, is not a gatekeeper and might not just you know, you know, uh, push you out of the castle you know, uh, as, as a barbarian. Um, so I, I begin with those trusted friends usually, especially, you know, sometimes you're like, I can't, this introduction is killing me, you know? you know, could you read these first thousand words? And then they'll, they'll write back like, yeah, that makes sense. Keep going. <laughs> you know, the most important thing is just to keep going, you know, and understand that like, it, you can't revise until you have a first draft. So just keep going, you know, and trust that process. And you not, you don't know how long it's going to take, but it, it's going to take a lot longer if you're not putting one foot in front of another. Yeah, George Saunders talks about um, just getting that first draft done. I mean, that's just get that out of the way. That's it doesn't matter. Then you can start working on it. Um, yeah. But you can't do anything unless you have that first draft. Uh, implicit in good writing is, is reading. So I'm curious, um, what do you read? Do you read um, one type of, of literature, one type of book? Um, what are you reading at right now? What's on your bedside table right now? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I feel like I read so much to, for my teaching, you know, like uh, teaching new classes. Uh, I, I teach as a nonfiction workshop and I, I create a nonfiction workshop and I try to like have new things on you know, every, every, every time I teach it. So that's a great way to, to rejuvenate, you know, um, you know, just trying to think what I, you know, I, I just taught this book by Michael Gora called Portrait of a Novel, which is a kind of a cultural biography of Henry James. It's a great book. Uh, it was the finalist for the Pulitzer. Um, and it's so it, it's both, it's this kind of double-stranded story about like what was going on in Henry James's life around the writing of Portrait of a Lady and then like what, ha what happens across Portrait of a Lady and why is it such a uh, you know, monumental and transformative work of literature, how can one novel kind of change everything in the history of the novel? Um, and I, I tend to read pretty widely, you know, because I just love a lot of, I, I'm, I'm, there's some scholars, uh, God bless them, who are really, like they know what they love and they just go so deep, they drill super deep and they deeper and deeper and deeper. 
And then I feel like I'm somebody who's got an enormous, I feel like I have a lot of enthusiasms, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of different kinds of music and a lot of different kinds of literature and a lot of different kinds of film and uh, in terms of the arts. I love a lot of history, I read a lot of history. Um, so, you know, there's just so much uh, to, to, to look at. I'm trying to think of a book I read recently um, that that blew me up my mind. I mean, an author who I love, and I can't wait to read her new book on George Orwell is Rebecca Solnit. I bet you, you've had her maybe uh, on Berkeley Writers at Work, but she's just, for me, an incredible model of this kind of omnivorous uh, uh, writer who can take in anything and make it 50 times more interesting and, and poignant and compelling than one ever imagined it was. Um, so I'll, I'll start with that. Okay, good, thank you. I am going to, um, selfishly, I have many more questions, but I am gonna to turn to the audience. We have some uh, questions here. Um, how do you fund a book that requires flying around for months or even years at a time to nail down your research? That is a great question. Well, you know, um, so fiction books are sold differently than nonfiction books. With a, with a fiction manuscript, as I understand it, I'm not a, a fiction writer, but if you're writing a novel or short stories, my sense is you have to have the whole manuscript if you're not an established writer. And then they read it and they're like, okay, we want this, you know. Um, for nonfiction, you write a proposal and you submit a sample. So you don't have to have written the whole thing before you sell it. Um, so generally, you know, you have to have a plan for what you're gonna do and an outline and then you have to have some kind of sample chapter that gives a sense of the, the voice uh, and, and you know, tone and so on uh, of, of the writing. So, you know, that you do have to find a way to have the time to write a good sample and, and to be able to project what the larger project will be. Um, and, you know, how do you fund that? I mean, if you're a grad student, you know, you can think of your dissertation as being, you know, a kind of proto book project, you know, um, if you want to write for a larger market, I can see people doing that. Um, you know, if you're a professor, it's, it's nice we have, you know, some, some time to, it's fortunately built into our lives, you know, to, to have time to incubate projects. Um, and, um, and I think profet I think faculty who are tenure track and, and good luck to the lecturers. I, I really support the fight of lecturers to get these kind of benefits. Um, you know, uh, have the time to incubate things and then, and then sell them. And in some ways have a, have a leg up in terms of these bigger nonfiction pro projects over the kind of freelance writers who are just doing that because it can be really hard if you're a freelancer to, to spend the time that one needs, especially on biographies are, are famous for taking eight to 10 years, you know? So, you know, like finding this person and this going to this archive and, and so on, you know? Um, and, and you can kind of tell the difference, you know, that, that you know, so a lot of freelance writers, they have, there, there's, there's more of a push, you know, and uh, for them to get that stuff out faster. Uh, this is a question, I believe this is from a student. Um, as you've mentioned, revision is such an important process, but when do you know that you're at a good place to publish your book? When do you feel like you have a composed final draft? In other words, do you tend to go through a certain number of drafts? Well, in some ways this is tied to the question of funding your book. You know, I, I sold my book to HarperCollins and they were like, okay, it's due at this time. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, I didn't really, I, I was like, okay, I think I can do that. And um, then I, I missed that deadline. And, uh, at, at, you know, that was scary. And at that point, um, my agent was like, you know, everybody misses deadlines. You know, it's, it's not unusual, but it's also true that HarperCollins has gone through this restructuring and they, they brought in these kind of, kind of corporate hatchet men. And, you know, they could try to cut loose any author who uh, is at a place of not having hand in their manuscript at the contracted date. 
So what you've done is normal, but you could be completely screwed. Well, that has a way of quickening the pulse, <laughs> you know, a writer. <laughs> and um, so anyway, it just worked really hard. And, and, and you know, you know, would things have been different if I had had an extra year? Yes. But, you know, at, at some point you're like, this is, I, I've covered the arc that I, I want, want to cover. Um, and now I'm going to go through it with, you know, I'm going to go through the editorial process. You know, and that's gonna that that's gonna lead to some revision. You know, and, and in the end, you know, there were there were some great edits, and great feedback that um, an editor gave me at Harper Collins, and then there was also a, a pressure at the very end of the process to cut immense a number of pages. They're like, we want this five hundred fifty book page book to be like three hundred fifty pages. And I was like, no way. I mean, like if you, if you were going to cut and then they showed me what it would be cut. And I was like, you've just turned this book into basically a, a slightly better book than what exists before. And all the texture and all the complexity, you're, like, you're stripping it out. I refuse. And um, that was good because, um, uh, you know, in the end, I, I stood by my rights as the author and they, they were okay with that. But you're going to get this kind of pressure, you know, um, and you have to have a certain kind of vision of what you're trying to do. Um, I don't know if that that answers that. Um, you know, I, I th think you got to be kind of happy with it. I, I don't re reconcile to it. I don't know. It's the quite the the word one uses. Um, there are several questions about Richard Pryor, but there's a question here that um, I'd, I'd like to address to you. Uh, it says, I'd be curious to hear about the challenges of writing about people of different racial and cultural backgrounds from our own and how that influences our choices about point of view, style, narrative stance. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think that this has evolved in, even in like the 10 years since I, or I mean, 10 years since I was really working intensely on the book. You know, um, I, th you know, I was self-conscious about that, you know, or self-aware, self you know, that I am a white Jewish guy of a certain generation. Um, when people asked me how I got into Richard Pryor, you know, I would always say, you know, I, I saw those movies where he was partnered with Gene Wilder when I was like seven years old. And I identified with the, the Gene Wilder character as the Jewish nebbish who knows that he like needs this friend to help him navigate and understand the world. I didn't begin identifying with Richard Pryor, but I knew that Richard Pryor had a lot to, to teach me, you know? And um, I said that in interviews when asked by whatever, Terry Gross, you know, I think. Um, but I think that now I probably would have built it into the book, you know, more to just be upfront about that. I think one should own where one's coming from. And um, it just makes things more honest and, and, and adds a layer of complexity as opposed to me trying to act like my experience represents everybody's experience. It doesn't, you know? Um, so own where you're coming from and try to understand it. I think it's important. Um, you know, in terms of writing this book, I felt like this is not like just my take on Richard Pryor. Uh, it's not just like a, a critic's take on Richard Pryor. It's a biography. So what it's a, where the research comes from is like trying to understand his life, um, bringing together a lot of different voices on Richard Pryor, of which I'm only one. And I often try to give those other voices prominence. You know, I think this is different from like how Oftentimes the way, um, you know, a critic writes, you know, like their voice is like the most important and, and, and they're going to, you know, end by like, you know, twisting uh, the knife or turning the screw on their argument at the very end. And I felt like oftentimes I would try to end with a quotation from somebody I had interviewed or a source that I had found that I thought captured some really powerful aspect. So to kind of, I saw my role as like, you know, kind of 
conducting these different voices that I had uh, found um, in the archives or that I solicited in, in interviews. And then, you know, trying to have it come together into the synthetic whole. Um, but it's a, it's a great, great question. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm all, you know, I, I, I had one, uh, I think my earlier book, I was less conscious of that. And uh, I'm not as happy with some passages <laughs> as a result. You know, um, like there's some passages, you know, Richard, uh, Charles Mingus has this really kind of in, insane uh, autobiography called Beneath the Underdog that has some very lurid kind of pornographic pass, semi-pornographic passages. And you have to talk about it because it's like really central to his autobiography. Um, and I just, like, I read that now and I was like, the tone is off. You know, I, I was trying to do something there, but now I just, older, maybe wiser, just different. Um, and I think there's something off, you know? So um, I think that's a, that's a great question. And tone is so important uh, in terms of, you know, style. And it's something we can really work on as writers. Choice of language, choice of diction. You know, do you seem like when I'm, you're talking about a piece of art, do you seem like you're above it? Like if I'm writing something, am I writing it in a way that, you know, somebody who comes from Peoria in the forties, like Richard Pryor wouldn't, like wouldn't get because I'm using language that's just seems different, you know? And one of the, like the most powerful moments for the reception of my book uh, came for me when I gave a, a, a reading at Revolution Books and uh, here in Berkeley, and uh, this guy, guy came in wearing a, he, he was a, a, ma a male man uh, and uh, African-American about Richard Pryor's a generation. And he said, you know, I love this book. I read it in my lunch hour. And, you know, every, every, every lunch hour, I can't wait to open it and, and learn more about Richard Pryor and the worlds that he came from and where he went. And uh, to me, that was so meaningful because I, I was trying to write it, you know, on the one hand for the people I know uh, in my department and for my students and, and so on. But I also hoped that it would reach a wider audience, uh, people, especially people who were coming out of some kind of similar generational uh, experiences of, as Richard Pryor, the social background as Richard Pryor. And that was very meaningful to me. His name was Gus. Really grateful to mailman Gus. Well, and there are plenty of mailman Gus out there that we can we can reach as well. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. There are more questions, more great questions. But I want to thank you, Scott Saul, Professor Scott Saul, Saul, for joining us today for Berkeley Writers at Work. I want to thank the audience for joining us. Um, I hope this was enlightening, interesting. Uh, this uh, will be archived. This interview will be archived at our website, writing.berkeley.edu, which is in the chat. We have all of our 20 some odd uh, interviews as well archived there. So please check them out. Uh, Scott, thanks again. It's been a pleasure well, talking you, John, to you. Thank you, and thank you everybody all out right. there for yeah. being here. And, and thanks to the college writing programs for uh, sponsoring this as always. All right, bye everybody. Thank you.